What is going on, my friends? I hope you are doing well today. The team at TRE wants to say thank you so much for all the support. Thank you for joining today. This is the Real Estate Podcast, and we want you guys to do us a solid. If you don't mind, can you help us get the message out? We believe that real estate can be for anybody, and we believe there's opportunities for people to grow with us. So if you can, please share, subscribe, like, comment. Thank you for being here on our journey, and we are going to continue to add as much value as we possibly can and try to shake up the industry. Let's dive in. You know, just understand that this is a long-term game. Yeah. You know, um, certainly people can flip things and they can make a quick buck. Uh, but again, at a certain point, the problem becomes, what do you do with that money? Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea of just whatever you're doing, compound it in a good way. Yeah. Compound it, whether it be education, uh, find tools to maximize your system. The, the thing that changed my life is just like looking at my income streams as a business and treating it as such. Uh, and find good investments and different strategies and allocate appropriately and just continue to watch it compound. All right, guys, welcome to the Real Estate Podcast. We got our boy Jason Ricks in the What's house. What's up? What's up? How are you doing, guys? Good, man. We uh, Long time, no chat. Long time. Hope everybody had a good <laughs> Christmas. We're back. And uh, we got our fun going, we got a lot to catch up on, and we figured we would take you guys on the journey of uh, just kind of what we're seeing in the market. Jason operates in a little bit different sector than us, so he always has a really good perspective on uh, a totally different side of real estate. Also, he's very analytical, so we got some graphs and some charts, but figured we would just catch up a little bit and then kind of update about the fund and what we're seeing in the market. And uh, as always, if you guys have any questions at the end, please comment, like, share with your friends. Uh, we're here to be a resource any way we can. So welcome, Jason. Yeah, welcome, guys. Thanks for having me back. Good to see you. What do you think of the uh, new studio? You know, I was just, uh, this is, so I grew up right on the street. Oh, really? Yeah, my brother worked at the Claremont, which is a senior living facility, and I used to come to that Sonic. So when I saw mm -hmm. that sign, I loved it, man. It's great. I'm really happy for you. Yeah, it's funny how this, thinking of real estate-wise, like, this is just a house all this is commercial yeah this property is on septic and so Dang. everything just grew up around it and, and and you can just see how fast things have changed but mm -hmm. it's a it's a really good location because you can just jump on 183 and get anywhere right for you sure close proximity to mopac and 360 so i know you guys are doing stuff all over central texas so this is a perfect central spot for you yep this is the uh tre hq baby i love it man 6810 mcneil yeah. So what's new with you, man? I mean, uh, kind of update us on what you got going on. Yeah. Um, father of two now. So I got a little daughter at home. She's six months. All right. Cutest thing. She's getting spoiled from uh, me and my wife, Sarah, and just uh, learning to adapt to, to a family of four, which yeah. is super exciting. Um, spending a lot of time with my son. He's three now. Okay. Got a lot of energy like his dad. So always outside, running around, getting in trouble with him. Um just focusing a lot on work. I think this past year was, it was just a huge accelerator. I mean, obviously all of us kind of saw it. Um, I think a lot of pent up demand from COVID. So activity was just robust. And then there's been so many headlines and movement in our industry in particular for probably the last three quarters that it's been kind of fascinating to kind of watch it unfold. And um, you know, that old saying that um, Warren Buffett says, you know, people get caught out by the tide, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to see who's got their ass hanging out. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of that kind of taking place now and unfolding. But uh, December for me is always a really good time to kind of just uh, unwind a little bit, kind of um, keep an internal scoreboard and kind of see where I'm at for the year. And then set my goals. Mm -hmm. What do I want to do for the next year? What do I want to focus? Where was I weak? Where do I need improvement? Um, so a lot of doing a lot of that kind of internal stuff, kind of cool. figuring some things out. Well, I love it. Would you say, uh, do you have any kind of easy things that you can point out, uh, lessons that you learned this year? Do you think like that? Like, man, I really learned these few lessons, 2022, anything that really sticks out for you? You know, I think, um, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's action. You can over contemplate, you can read five books on something. You can get really knowledgeable about it, but you got to get in it. Mm -hmm. The best experience is by going through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll use this fund as an example. You know, I've never been a big accounting guy. Like, I have a system that I usually like to, to have for my for my own personal income and stuff. But um, learning that knowledge of accounting, man, and taxation, it's, it's amazing. 
you know, and really doing a deep dive. I mean, because that was one area that we kind of needed to make sure we got the operations down um, packed, which was which has been really strong for us. But kind of learning that process, mm-hmm. um, just getting into action, just making things happen. Yeah, not worrying about a million different outcomes, not over contemplating. Um, and uh, the beauty about having kids is, you know, this there's not a lot of free time. So when you get those windows or you don't have as much free time as you used to have before mm-hmm. kids. Mm-hmm. So when you get those windows, man, you got to go all in, you yeah. figure it out and get lost in what you love doing. Yeah. It's a good way to put it into the action. I mean, you're just always going to deal with setbacks and you just got to keep pushing through yeah. with everything in business. And, um, there's no just easy course with, with realtors, investors, brokers. Mm-hmm. We've had a lot of lessons. We were, I'll just throw this out there. We uh, <clears throat> we were looking at what we were trying to do as a company, and really, in a lot of ways, we were trying to be all things to all people, yep. a- agent-wise. thought like, hey, everyone can come here and succeed. And we realized, man, like 40 agents out of 200 made up 97% of the revenue. 80-20, yep. And the the crazy thing was those 40, they really didn't require much from us. They just figured things out. Mm-hmm. And the rest of them, not bad people by any means. It's just they required so much time and effort, and they didn't really do much. Yep. And we spent the last 11 months really catering to those to the people that weren't because we were like, we can help them. We can get them over yep. that. But you just can't want it more than someone wants it for themselves. And so that's been freeing for me. Yep. Um, because I just I just can't tie myself to people that aren't just dead serious or just getting after it. And I wouldn't want other people to do – I wouldn't want to do that to anyone else on the flip side. Yeah. Um, so we're just trying to triple down on what we think we're best at, which is finding opportunities, hustling, you yeah. know, uh, taking risks, fighting through. And it's been a little bit of a shift in the last, like, probably month or two for us there. Taking care of those 100x employees is everything, right? And kind of building systems to find those people. Yeah. Like I imagine for y'all's business is huge. Yeah, and the, and the other thing is, like, if somebody's not really getting after it and they're not, and you're trying to pull them, you're probably just hurt. you're probably just prolonging what that oh, they yeah. need to do something else anyways. For sure, it's a mutual benefit. For yeah, it, it, that's what I'm saying. Part. Yeah, 100 percent agree with that. Yeah, I think we learned a few uh, psychology lessons about ourselves and about other people. Uh, you know, with the different types of people and kind of what they're here for, or what they're at, whatever place they're there for, and what they get out of it, and uh, kind of where we should focus our attention. You know, we get so busy with our head down a lot of times. Like, that's how a lot of us solve problems, just like we're going to grind through it. We're going to yeah. put our head down and just. Right. But you got to lift your head up every once in a while, right? And kind of see the big picture. Yeah. And it's cool that you guys were recognizing that, though. Yeah. It was a it was a good, really, it was a freeing lesson for me. Um, and I think the market shift kind of brought it up a little bit. Because it was, man, real estate for the last, like, probably at least three or four years here. Uh, but really, at least for me, the market's been hot since I started. It's been pretty easy. Like in Austin in the last three years, it was so easy to, you just had to like know somebody and yeah. you just put a sign up, it sells, there's no negotiation, just like bring me your best offer. You get 20 of them, you pick the highest, whatever it may be. And then we started realizing when it shifted, these realtors, like they're kind of clueless. I mean, you call these realtors now and nobody's like trying to sell it or pitch it and this is just the time that you really got to go all in to set yourself apart. No, oh, I totally agree with that. Um, we see the same thing on the commercial side. There's just kind of a cleansing. Yeah. You get a lot of, during a bull market, you get a lot of built up agents, um, leasing brokers, et cetera. Um, and they're doing pretty good when things are hot, but at the moment that that, you know, just tempers off, mm-hmm. a lot of people just get, there's a mass exodus of For, agents uh, in the industry. Commercial tenants? Uh, commercial uh, leasing agents. Right, right, but I mean, like, for the leasing agents, going oh, yeah. out and finding commercial tenants, yeah, I'm totally. sure you got to hustle when nobody wants more office space, nobody's, everybody's contracting, you got to go out there and or, find tenants. And it exposes your pipeline and all your other systems you've created. You guys are real big on that. I like that. Y'all talk about building systems and like mm-hmm. a business, like you're building a business. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, you know, if you don't put time into your business, man, it's going to really show up during the, the tough times. Everyone yeah. can ride the wave when things are going good. Right. What does it look like for a commercial leasing agent? So like, you know, now when, and I imagine, tell me if this is inaccurate, but businesses are contracting. They don't want to go out and get more space or expand. 
and therefore you're not really, you know, leasing out a whole bunch of office space or whatever you're leasing out. But do you just have to go out there and convince somebody why this is beneficial for their business and they have to do this because it's going to provide X, Y, and Z? And Yeah, totally. And you um, that's when you really have to establish relationships ahead of time. Um, whether it be like you got to help your you got to help out your your clients <coughs> you know if they need to downsize if they need to you know do an assignment or sublease um, you know if they're looking at kind of uh, growing their business how you can like really help them out I mean that's when those real entrenched relationships mm-hmm. kind of are forged but like yeah when um, if you don't really put time into that and in your pipeline and in, in your clients yeah you're just gonna be left with nothing essentially when, yeah. when the market turns and that's a, I think that's a lesson that a lot of young agents uh, deal with. And in particular, when I used to be an agent, you know, a lot of my clients were landlords, right? So I'd have to go and find those landlords and talk to them. And, you know, yeah, I could call them a couple times a year, but like when things are really tough, and you may have to call them, you know, every month to either reassure them or kind of talk about what their portfolio, what they need. Um, are they struggling with another agent? And then they may get you a new listing, one that you might be better suited for. So it's, it's a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, the joke is um, when times are really tough, people just go and play golf, the brokerage community. You yeah. Know, the top 10%, they're just like, screw it. We're yeah. not going to work that hard. We know that in this market, it's going to be really hard. So we're going to go work on our handicap and we'll yeah. be back in a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Interesting. Yeah. We were, we were with, at Cardone's event and he called one of his top brokers and he was golfing. Yeah, well, I don't think that guy was struggling with. Well, that's what, I'm, that's what he's saying. It's, these are the top brokers <coughs> but we've, that go do this. The, what you brought up, I'm fascinated with financial history. Um, Post-2008, interest rates have been historically low, <coughs> like really low. Um, we we bailed out a lot of banks, right? And so you saw these this, just kind of steady rise in asset values and people getting cheap debt. Um, this is our first since probably... Yeah, I mean, this is going back to 08, man. This is our first time we've seen rates jump this high yeah. in a long time. That's, I mean, I started in 2012, and, like, I've never experienced this. No, no. I mean, a lot of people haven't. I think that's kind of the lessons that we're <coughs> learning, too, is it's humbling, right? Yeah. You cannot count your chickens before they, mm-hmm. you know, before they hatch. Let's, let's pull up that interest rate graph, if you can, real fast. Look at it. <coughs> and, and one thing I wanted to talk about uh, regarding this, too, though, is – when COVID happened and we we're printing all this money, it seems so obvious now looking back. I know. Is that something, did y'all think about that? Or I didn't at all. I was just like, you know, you just gotta get assets, which is right. Yeah. But it seems so obvious that this is what would happen. 20% M2 growth, 22, <clears throat> like 20%. I thought, the, it was, we, I thought it was higher than that. It was like, I think it was like 21 to, uh, 22 percent it's mm-hmm. crazy mm-hmm. yeah i mean and you know the way they track cpi versus the way they used to do it back in the 80s is totally different um and so it's it's really fascinating but yeah 20 percent. think about all that and here's the interesting part too instead of bailing out banks like mm-hmm. they did in 08 they mm-hmm. just gave it to people right, right. <laughs> yeah. and they forgave these loans and stuff man so yeah. like you yeah. know when you really break down what we what happened and again some of it's like the fog of war, right? Like we didn't know what we were dealing with with COVID. Right, right. People were, I mean, it was craziness. Um, but yeah, when you print that much money into circulation and you give it to people, they're going to do what they do best, which is shop. And um, at first they saved it and then they started spending it. And now they're really spending it. And I thought everybody uh, put it on, uh, putting call options on GameStop. <laughs> you saw some of that. You saw the you saw the crypto stuff. You saw a lot of the meme stocks. Um, but I, for me, because I'm in retail, I saw the consumer spending. Yeah, that's what I track, and it it's been legit. It's been off the charts good. Yeah, some of those NFT like those things were selling for like a hundred million dollars. They're probably worth nothing right now, right? I don't know. I mean, yeah, but I mean, that should have been so obvious. Are you talking about the uh, stimulus checks? Yeah, but just like even like the PPP loans, man. Yeah, like, going out you know, to yeah, just to keep people employed and, right, and yeah. keep the lights on. But like those, all, a lot of those loans were forgiven. Most of them were forgiven. Yeah, I'm talking trillions of dollars, just you know, just thrown into the economy. What else was given? Uh, so it was PPP. It was the stimulus checks, and then it was uh, unemployment benefits. Where something happened where they're increased or prolonged or something. There, correct? Yeah, and student loan student uh, loan payments forgiveness. Were suspended. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of interesting things, and like Texas is very 
business landlord friendly, but like my stuff in California, some of these people haven't paid rent in like six, nine months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a crazy town out there, man. It's unbelievable that people can game the system. Yeah. Were y'all thinking of, but like my question is like, I wasn't thinking about any of this. Were you guys? Yeah. I mean, th- you, you can't, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen or what the end result was going to be. But when all this was happening, it was like, you, you can't just give out all this money and, yeah. and not experience the negative results of it. I felt like there was like just slowly like this avalanche building, but, but here's the one thing that I um, really recognized post COVID. I felt like I was just flooded with stuff like mentally, like um, the news cycle was just all encompassing. Like I just felt like I couldn't get out of the work and, and some of it was like putting out fires at work. But then man, when you get off of work, it's just like the stories would come out and it was just like a, and just like a flood to try to keep up with everything. Um, and so it almost kind of like took my attention away from like the big pieces to your point, which is like, yeah. did, did we not think? What's going but on? I mean, think about how crazy this is. You saw the home values go up, you know, post COVID. It was mm-hmm. insane. Mm-hmm. I mean, huge. I mean, you guys, I mean, look, at us. I, I think I've read stuff where it's like, they've gone up 40% in two years. Yeah. That's true. That's like a decade's worth of gains in two years. They went up uh, 41% June 2020 to June 2021. But like it was, it's just, it was so hard because we're in Austin where you're like, well, yeah, this kind of, you can justify why that makes sense. Yeah. It's like, this is a small market. Elon's coming here. Oh yeah. Amazon's coming. We're going to be like California. Yeah. And we probably still are. Yeah. Um, but it was it was just it was like a perfect storm because here you're like, yeah, jobs and people keep coming here. Of course, value should go up forty yep. percent, and they should go up another forty yeah. percent. Well, it was probably f- so. It was, yeah, sure, it's it's that, and then I mean the rates didn't drop that much, but maybe they were at what like a three and a quarter, and then twenty twenty they dropped down to two point five, give or take. So I mean the rates dropped uh, when COVID happened. All the you know money was being given out. The demand so also during this time for austin specifically is when you know people were leaving california so california new york and all these other places uh you know the restrictions or whatever was happening with the local government there or, you know the work uh elon and oracle and everybody started moving to austin uh right at that time as well late 2020 people had the money debt was free basically uh all the demand nobody wanted to sell their house they were looking to buy houses um so all those things just kind of oh perfect storm and if i could go back a little bit i'm a big fed guy like i love studying the fed go back to what pal said when he was giving out all these checks and all the stimulus he was like i'm gonna let inflation run hot a little bit and then it shifted to inflation's transitory right and then now all of a sudden it's gangbusters out to like stomp inflation to me the biggest thing that we probably missed the Fed should have have raised rates earlier, is my honest opinion. I yeah. think they should have done it a lot earlier. Mm-hmm. I think um, this transitory comment, you know, I think it was used as kind of a, a blanket to, I know there's some supply chain issues and, and those were valid to a certain degree, but I think they thought it was just gonna be a blip and come down, but clearly it did not just blip and come down. I think if they would have raised rates quicker, <coughs> I think it would have uh, stopped that growth of 40% on homes and we would have been in a much more stable environment right well that was another thing added to the storm is the supply chain so cost of building homes in austin went up drastically as well have you seen the price so i didn't i didn't include this because i didn't want to over inundate this this conversation but the cost of lumber right oh my god i think it's back down (laughs) quite a bit now it looks like bitcoin no joke like if y'all you know maybe i can do this later we can put in the call notes or something but that graph of lumber cost is off the charts it's mm-hmm. crazy. So you saw a lot of commodities go and bouncing around and man, we're still digesting it all, obviously. But um, yeah, this is the new normal. I think it's just like a paradigm shift, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I think we've gone from this period of low rates for a while and that was kind of the run we had. Mm-hmm. And now it's going to be, you know, this elevated rates and kind of going back to um, fundamentals and basics, mm-hmm. cash flow, smart investments, mm-hmm. cheaper debt. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry, not cheaper debt, less leverage on for, with debt. Um, and just being more prudent. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that. What's interesting is like the NASDAQ. I mean, you're seeing it really get hit with uh, tech and growth stocks. 
Yeah. Which we were, I know we were looking at some some charts earlier today with Tesla and Google. Disney. And yeah. Disney. I mean, just on massacred the, out there. On the commercial side, so with the the shopping centers or multifamily or anything y'all are doing there, did y'all uh, so during this period, uh, did y'all approach uh, investing differently? So like, uh, I got pretty much started in this period, 2018, right, and then two years leading up to 2020 when everything hit and really started shooting up. Uh, but, you know, we still uh, tried to buy. Uh, we never went and offered, you know, uh, ask price for properties. Yep. We, s we still tried to buy far below what we felt was value. <coughs> and we're still in uh, good shape on, I mean, we're, uh, you know, 2X, 3X on a lot of stuff we bought in uh, 2020. Um, but I'm curious on the commercial side, did y'all still invest with those disciplines or were things obviously you probably had to buy it, you know, much lower cap rates. Uh, but did anything change on y'all's in there? We didn't buy any centers this year. We bought four the year before. Um, I will say this, we're very much like you guys, which is we buy the property and we sell the income. Like we sell the improvement, right? So we like taking something that's got a little bit of hair on it. You know, someone who doesn't love it, hasn't cared for it for a while. We buy it, fix it up, uh, doing various different strategies and then we sell it what has impacted us is cap rates. Um, and that's just the metric, it's called a capitalization rate. Um, it's a relationship between price and net operating income. And um, I, I say this, cap rate, the best way you can think about <coughs> it is like your year one return if you were to buy the property all cash. Mm -hmm. What would it yield me? Yeah. So we've definitely seen cap rates move up. They tend to go up when bond yields go up. So and the one metric we study the most is called the 10-year treasury. Um, that really sets the benchmark for a lot of debt, whether it be mortgages or cap rates or whatever. That weighted cost of capital is, is really kind of heavily closely correlated with the 10-year um, treasury. So since that's gone up, some of our cap rates on our shopping centers have definitely gone up. So we felt that price issue on sale. But um, I can tell you on the apartment side, um, yeah, it's really impacted us because, you know, when you own a, a huge portfolio of, of apartment units, whether it's like Grant Cardone, those guys like that, I mean, I guarantee you he has the 10 year on his phone and he's tracking it every day because that's really going to determine where his cap rates go. Um, I mentioned this to you guys earlier, but if you have a 1% increase in cap rate, that's a 10% reduction in the price. If it's mm -hmm. 2%, mm -hmm. it's like over 21%. And 3% is a 33% reduction. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. that's happening right now. So, like, when, Alex, when you referenced earlier, hey, the, you know, the 10-year was, like, really low, right? Um, cap rates were near the floor. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, they're going back up to, like, <coughs> six, seven, eight on some of my shopping centers. Like, whew. But it's really only relevant if you'll have to sell right now or refi right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you know, it really is not extremely important. And yeah, it's just a paper loss, right? right. Like, it's just a hypothetical paper loss, yeah. 100%. That's what I've been saying. Like, you can't – you, if the only reason to sell right now is if you absolutely have to. And the, the metric that I was looking at was if rates go from 3 to 6, then your payment goes up 50%, yeah. essentially. Yeah, totally. Is there a metric that uh, – people look at for interest rates and cap rate at like some kind of if it goes up this much cap rates inherently stay one percent above that or something like that yeah so alex and i we were looking for the fund <coughs> we were looking at a what was that a 20 unit apartment complex on the east side of austin mm -hmm. and uh, they were trying to sell it at some you know at a cap that would <laughs> they were would trying be to market it. for like you know yeah. back a year and a half ago four right? four and a half yeah and uh, I did the math, and I was like, no, no lender will touch this. So what I always say is, depending on the quality of the asset, if it's like a class A, beautiful project, typically you want at least 50% basis points, that's 0.5% mm -hmm. of a spread from the cap rate. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. If you buy one of the nicest apartments in Austin right now for four cap, mm -hmm. you wanna have your debt at like three and a half percent. Yeah, that makes sense. You need that little cushion. But even when the market was hot, it was people weren't doing that, right? Like, at least in Austin, like rates were four and a quarter, but they were paying two caps or three caps. 
Well, keep in mind, like Fannie and Freddie, if you if you get the right type of uh, deal structure, those rates were like down in the twos, man. Yeah. So that's why it can, you could justify the three, you know, the three and a half cap, right? Because you were getting debt at three percent, right? Um, I did a large refi for a deal in California. We got in right before we locked the rate at some <laughs> ridiculous number. Oh my god! And it like literally within a couple months. I know you guys experienced those couple months where it's like it just ballooned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we were already locked in, and I swear they were trying to do everything they could to like screw that to up. To get for you us. out. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. We had to do all these estoppels last minute. They had all these changes. But uh, no, we definitely saw that kind of unfolding. Uh, and then the other interesting thing is at the biggest levels, right? At the biggest of biggest levels, like the big institutions, the pension funds, whatever. When cap rates go up like they have, they start looking at other asset classes to deploy capital into, mm -hmm. right? So the darling of the real estate world has been multifamily and industrial. But as those cap rates have grown, they're kind of like, hmm, what's a better long-term 10-year performance play? Is it kind of sticking with multifamily and, and <coughs> you know industrial, or should I go invest in equities? And so you have this kind of redistribution or um, asset allocation theory that's going out and with the big boys that you want to have 20% of their funds in real estate. Well, if they've lost some value or gained some value, then they're going to focus on, okay, I've lost a ton of money in equity, so now I have to rebalance my portfolio and make sure I have 50% of my fund in equities and 20% in real estate. Mm -hmm. So you track kind of where the funds are going mm -hmm. and that's a really good indicator. Um, and I usually think like those folks on the, whether it be large funds or private equity, they're, they're X amount of months ahead of the market. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff that we see like on mainstream, you know, TV or whatever, it, dude, that was six months ago. Like right. we're already beyond it. Right. Like it. This market's been moving so fast. Mm -hmm. Like, and you guys feel this, right? I mean, yeah. Anyway, so um, you the, know, cushions, uh, the cushions are a really big deal. And in particular on the shopping centers I buy, I want like 100 to 150 bips, sometimes like 200 basis points, so yeah. 2% higher. That's pretty good. Yeah. Do you uh, do you know many operators in the uh, retail side that have bought, uh, you know, shopping centers on uh, um, adjustable loans that are probably coming due soon here? Yeah, so that was the other thing that was happening, all these floating interest rate loans, right? Because why not float it when rates were so cheap when the Fed funds rate was like next to nothing? So mm -hmm. a lot of people were living by that and saying, oh, you know, life's great. And then all of a sudden that floating rate went sky high. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, ran to the exits to get things fixed. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, they're not building a tremendous amount of shopping centers. We, uh, I still think we're overdeveloped in shopping centers. So um, I will say this though, on construction debt for like multifamily, that's not fixed a lot of times. And that's been a huge, huge punch to the industry. Um, so they've been, they've, been, they've been really kind of uh, hogtied with, uh, with those uh, construction loans. Mm -hmm. It's been really tough. Yeah. Do you see it going back to where it was ever? Like the twos and... Not for a while. Yeah. And when I, when I mean for a while, like I don't see it for 20 a decade. years. Yeah. yeah. I for a decade. <laughs> That's I what I feel like. I just, I, I mean, look at the chart, man. Um, we have yeah, to get back it, to sound money principles. I think, what, I mean, was there ever a time it was down that low? Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Maybe in you're like really, the 30s. really testing my knowledge. I think, yeah, World War II, I think we dropped the rates down to zero. So, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe well, 100 years from now. Yeah, it's just because there was this guy that. Um, yeah, I know you were bought into that guy, and I still am. I mean, uh, the guy from A and M, the the uh, real estate center. Oh yeah, Mark, I know him. Mark Doutzer. Yeah, I study his stuff. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's a respected. Yeah. Um, but his whole theory is that they are going to come back down. It's because they have to. Well, all right. Look at the cost of like a U.S. debt, mm -hmm. right? in all the different maturities, right? So sometimes we have uh, IOUs, I call them, right? It's just government debt, but IOUs. Sometimes they're one-year bills, two-year bills, five-year, 10-year, 30-year, whatever. I, we're so indebted as a country that that really high interest rate mm -hmm. becomes a lot of money. Like, you know, the interest burden becomes huge. So I think rates are gonna have to come down, but I don't see them going back down to where we had yeah, yeah. during the COVID he said times. that He said they're gonna go lower than that. And oh. yeah, I know. Well, and I mean, he didn't. And, he, and what he was saying too is, and and I hadn't looked into this as detailed as you know a lot of people have. But he's like, look, I'm not, I'm not 
just saying this. I he's like I read the the footnotes of the Federal Reserve meetings. He's like they've said this. Well, they're not going to raise rates for forever. They're going to raise rates. They're going to bring them down. They're going to stabilize a little bit. They may lower them when this happens. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a constant fluctuation. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, that call, uh, he wasn't saying they're going to be back down in the twos in six months. No, he did. He said, but he did say, like, within a year. That's what he said. It's fascinating. <laughs> but I, I know. I, I've seen the Fed notes, um, and it's very telling where they forecast things are going to be. Yeah. Um, and I, Jerome Powell's kind of stuck to his guns on this on this rate. I mean, he hasn't really adjusted at all. Um, it's funny. Like he'll say something that kind of sounds hawkish or bullish or dovish or whatever the terms all these people use. Mm-hmm. Like it could be bullish or bearish, and it can move the market. Like that's how just crazy. Just one word. Oh, yeah. Just a couple words. Yeah. Or like maybe his tone. Maybe he's soften on his tone <laughs> so people just jump in. Um, but, yeah, it's fascinating seeing the, uh, the evolution of it. But time will tell, won't it? I mean uh, – I certainly, when I look at the government debt and all the different varying maturities, we can't keep this game up for very much longer, in my opinion. We maybe have another six months where we can keep hammering at rates, but eventually that uh, interest on the debt's just going to be too high and yeah. a burden. Yeah. Well, back to our point of, like, <clears throat> you got to be in the game. I mean, yeah. If, yeah. if you were the person that sat on the sidelines for the last five years and you're like, I'm just going to wait till it crashes – it's still uh, hard to get in the game even now. Yeah, totally. Like you got to have your processes and your systems and you got to know the right people. Yeah. You can't just like jump in and start buying real estate if you hadn't been doing anything. In totally. my opinion, not yeah, not only that. Not at a scalable level. Or you a buy way. one deal here or there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. well, not only that, but like, <laughs> you know, if you weren't buying in 2020 when things were skyrocketing, uh, and you could buy right in 2020 when things were skyrocketing, but uh, your debt was really cheap, uh, but now as prices have come down and your debt's much higher, uh, you may not even be able to afford it now. So you're missing. That's you, what I'm you're saying. Completely missing out yeah. on the opportunity. So th- it, it's it's may the co- the reason for this is like maybe there's some hope here and like it's always going to be challenging, like we said oh, earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just gotta freaking roll with it. Look, time in the market <clears> is more <throat> valuable than timing the market, right? And all these different vintages, we can talk about this, you know, dollar cost average theory. You know, no one knows. Not even the smartest people know. I even track like Ray Dalio. He doesn't, you know, he has a hard time predicting these things. Mm -hmm. So there's no telling what could happen or if there's going to be a black swan event or something else random that will happen. But um, yeah, man, you just got to keep investing because what's the alternative? Right. Give me a better alternative. Are you going to sit in cash? Yeah. Show me a graph of cash over, you know, 10, 20 years. It's not going to... Inflation is going to eat it away. Yeah. So you got to put it somewhere. Um, and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll have a bounce back in 10 years from now. No one's even going to be like, this will just be a blip on the radar. Right. I know you have that long term mindset. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's really hard. I tell this to people all the time. Everyone wants to talk about investing, but what they're really wanting to chat about is trading. What's going to make me rich fast? What's mm-hmm. going to, what can I get in and get out of and make a quick buck? Mm-hmm. I don't care about all that. It's just noise. The The real mental exercise is committing to a plan, and that's investing. You know, just year after year, year Sticking after year. to it. Year <laughs> after, like getting good, crone, you know, like hone in your craft. Yeah. Become better at it, smarter at it, and yeah. just keep going. Right. Most of the uh, people who want to just sit and talk about uh, getting rich fast, too, I mean, that's about all they, they want to do. It's kind of one of the psychology lessons that I was saying that we learned is – uh, I think most people enjoy just uh, kind of feeling good about uh, having that conversation or be in a room where that conversation is being had to make them feel good about, you know, the idea of getting rich yeah. fast versus uh, even the act of getting rich fast, which yeah, requires the, work and risk and everything else. The yeah. Cardone event, it was it was really good, but it was just so fascinating to us because – and I'd take nothing away from what Grant's doing and, you know, but like they'd get like 2000 people in this room. Right. And the questions that people would ask would be so simple that you could literally just type this in on Google and get your own answer. Yeah. But they'd pay, you know, a thousand dollars, thousands to be there. And then they would pay 25 grand to be part of this group. And I'm like, I don't think they actually want to do any of this. So I think they just want to feel good about, themselves like that they think they're trying to do something yeah and they would pay 25 grand for stuff we would give everybody for free 
and we've been given for free. You, I mean, we talked about it earlier, 80, 20, man. Yeah. Right. When you talked about your agents, it's 80, 20. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I also think it's really interesting. There seems to be this like evolution of people that are trying to pitch like, um, Hey, come to my webinar or come to my like teaching event or mm-hmm. come be a part of my group to get paid. Mm-hmm. And the best real estate people that I know, they don't want to mess with that. That's like small potatoes to them. Yeah. So it's, you have to kind of, are these people real estate people or are they trying to sell you on a seminar? Yeah. But I'm not saying Grant isn't that. No, no, I don't think he he's is. making a lot of money on these events. I know. And, and that's, but that's the trade off is like, if you're trying to scale, like, cause we've been giving it for free and we're shifting towards doing that kind of stuff yeah. in a sense, because then you do actually find out a little bit more who's serious, but yep. you also get paid for your time. Yeah. You know, cause great. Cause that event that he did, he did raise $16 million. And so like his he's a monster. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's probably the cream of the crop when it comes to be hosting those types of events. He brings a ton of dude. Money. He's well, 60 well, something years old and he stood up there for three days and like we're grinders and we're hard workers. Talk, and I'm yeah. like, that's, f- that guy is a beast. And then he was on Twitter spaces for like yeah, two hours after, but you're like me, like we're all similar. Like dude, sitting in a chair for three hours, like you and I are not built for that. Like you yeah. need to go run some laps or something. In yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just to keep everything going. Well, he wouldn't sit in a chair. He was, Pacing yeah, on stage, say, up and down. Yeah, yeah. But he's uh, sixty something years old, man. I'm but sorry. those events he's are killer. those events are not. Uh, I mean, those are extremely multifaceted. Yeah. Uh, in terms of revenue for all of the companies there, that wasn't uh, you know a webinar uh, or a seminar to like learn some. That was a well thought out, well executed, uh, fully optimized uh, event to maximize revenue, and at the same exact time the experience for the person who was there. It wasn't just uh, people getting sold and people, uh, you know, paying money they for They enjoyed it. They, like enjo- they had fun. They so enjoyed yeah. every <laughs> single second of it. It's, um, I've been in this thing for so long. It's so funny to me. It's like, you know, there's a lot of real estate influencers. Grant's probably the most marquee yeah. out of all of them. But like, it's the podcast, it's the YouTube, it's the book, it's the seminar, it's, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and all of it is a beautiful cycle to get him to, to have money into assets. Yeah. And using other people's money to kind of grow it, not only, you know, other people's money, I mean, they're gonna get paid too, obviously. Yeah. But it, it's it's a perfect little mechanism, and I see a whole bunch of sponsors do it, to just go back to their core business, which is, how can I raise funds to, yeah. to grow? Cause and it's probably different though. Like, yeah. the old school guys would just do it to just get paid for just that. Yep. and not make it this all-encompassing. But it's the it's the beauty of um, you know just the internet these days. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. just touch so many different people, man. And then you, when you, I'm sure he's been promoting that event for a while, and t- to raise that much money is crazy. But it's it's, I, we were I, just studying the business side, dude. He's got this sales army, <laughs> and when they finish the speaking, they start selling everybody. Some dude tried to s- create his own deal, and he got kicked out. He sold like hundreds of thousands because he's like, I'll sell mine cheaper. And got 300 people in a hotel wow. room and wow. sold them. Wow. Wow. Anyways. How do we, uh, we get on that? I guess my whole point was uh, it, it was the whole oh, thing. Oh, yeah, the psychology of the uh, – Yeah, just being in the game because, like, you know, we were talking about this with our fund. Like, and we were lucky because we were – and Austin's so different. You don't really – single family-wise, you don't get a lot of cash flow, if any. Yeah. And so what we were always judging what we were buying on is, like, we were looking at the market – in real time and we were just like let's just be lower than that and we're yeah. seeing it as being brokers and having agents like oh okay these guys are all buying this for five let's be at four or 420 yeah, yeah. and so that was the metric we were using totally versus you know this is a 10 percent cash on cash cash flow every month because yeah. that's just austin and so you just have to have these different strategies per different markets because there's different ways to to approach it and uh it worked out well i mean it, you know we have a lot of properties and they've all basically gone down a hundred K yeah. And you know, it's probably multiple millions on that, yeah. but we're still okay because we, we bought below value the entire time. A hundred percent. No. And you, you know, <coughs> it's uh, I love the fun business, man. Cause it's, it's the purest form. You get judged on your returns and it's so simple and it's so like in that its own little way, it's beautiful. Right. But yeah. like, yeah, if, um, it doesn't matter about the hype, just the numbers. Yeah, just the numbers, just no emotion, right? But if you would have bought <coughs> Tesla six months ago at a 20% discount, you'd have been jumping up and down. Right. But now the stock's dropped you know, tremendously. And so it's just, you get judged at the end of the day on what your return is. And I think the best operators know how to perform in the best of times and worst of times. Yeah. 
and we're probably in the trenches just like everyone else mm-hmm. um, solving that. But no, at the time that we bought all of these deals, we were super excited about. Yeah. And here's the beauty. Because we bought them so low, and yeah. you, what do you preach to, to us all the time? Yeah. You make money on the buy, right? Right. Um, I mean, because you've done that, our returns are still positive for the year by double digits. Right. And that's using our base case. That's not even our best case scenario. Mm-hmm. We, we just did the math again because we break down the math all the time. But I mean, we're still up. Right. And think about the spread between if an investor put in 100K mm-hmm. into the S&P 500 in April, or they put it in the T- TRE, like mm-hmm. our growth fund. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're up like, yeah. I mean, dude, 60. I think the S&P's down, <laughs> what, almost 20% this year? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and th- that's the other thing, too, is like you said, best times and worst times. So knowing how to make money in the best times and the worst times. Uh, right now, uh, the way to make money has changed yeah. uh, compared to where it was last year. Totally. Uh, in six months from now, uh, there's going to be opportunities that we don't know are going to be there yet. I mean, we've learned some new opportunities that have come up in real time as we've seen them present themselves. And six months from now, there's going to be ways that the fund's going to be able to make money that we are not oh, expecting right now. A hundred percent. I'll tell you one thing that I heard from uh, S- Story Built. You know those guys? Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, somebody else that was really plugged in with all these builders and i uh am on the outside of this ju- this is just what i heard yeah but they said that in 2007 2009 all these builders here they they had to continue to finish out their projects they were just kind of like in the middle of it they said right now they're all just stopping completely they're just not building and so their theory is that in six months to eight months, there's going to be another massive shortage here in Austin on what's available. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about this. So I, I go back to all these graphs. I love studying this stuff. The um, First of all, the this is not 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. The credit scores of people that purchase homes and their indebtedness, like the rate of their mortgage, so much of it's below 4%. The home, the homeowners in such good shape here, in Central Texas and nationally, because rates were so low they got locked in. They're doing awesome. I think there's two different markets, right? There's the um, new home builder market, and then there's the current owner occupied market. Current owner occupied market to me, they're going to be at a standoff, dude, because if they're going to put their mar- their house up on the market, they don't need. I mean, they have amazing debt on it. Yeah. I mean, it's great. You have under four percent. Yeah. They're going to want a price, but I think we're going to have to live through all this pain of all the force for a build and sell developers that are going to have to, we're going to have to live through that glut and get that out of the way yeah. and get that absorbed because that's what's really dragging down prices. You talked about, you know, I buyers and all these other different groups that have purchased all these assets that also kind of drove some home values And a up. lot here in yeah, Austin. In Austin. And that's why we've seen this glut and this dump on the market. Yeah. But I think as soon as that gets removed, I mean... The uh, current occupiers of, of homes that are sub four, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're they're in great they're in great shape, right? And I think to your point, which is really interesting, if all the home developers are on the sidelines right now, not building anything new, and then no one's moving from these homes, they got under four percent debt. There, mm-hmm. no one's leaving. Mm-hmm. I just think there's just going to be again, there's going to be more imbalance of people that want to buy a home than there is. So the supply and demand is just going to be skewed in our favor. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is good for society, by the way. Like, mm-hmm. personally, I think it's kind of sad yeah. that Austin is just underdeveloped and, and we're going to be the beneficiaries of that. But it's just the reality. Mm-hmm. More and more people are moving. You can open up that chart, too, of all the people that the migration patterns yeah. coming from California, from Illinois, from New York. How many is it per day to Austin? <sighs> I, I don't have that data. This is one of my favorite that I pull up. It's U-Haul data that comes out. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and this is just the domestic mi- migration patterns. I mean, obviously, the two beneficiaries of people leaving New York, Illinois, and California is Texas and Florida. Yeah. Follow the U-Haul trucks. And it's isn't it the name of the game? Just um, especially in residential and the, the business we're in, it's just it's just following the migration patterns, right? Yeah. We just if population keeps coming here, and we can show the unemployment uh, rate in Austin. Um, too but it's it right now we're like we're like 2.7 percent what is this mortgages yeah i want to talk about that one here in a second maybe we can go to there we go yeah look at the unemployment rate for austin yeah, yeah. 
I mean, we're still so attractive, and we're so low. If you, you want a job, come to Austin. Can you go to five-year on the unemployment? If you want a job, come to Austin. You heard that. <laughs> Look at that, man. Yeah. That's crazy. Staying steady right there around 2.7. Two then we continue to get population growth, and we're not going to be building enough homes for these folks. Right. Well, and a lot and of no, and no sellers are going to sell. They're they're in their mortgages for under four yeah. percent. Well, a lot of the jobs haven't even gotten to Austin yet. That's the other thing. We have all this news breaking, right? But they haven't built everything out yet. Yeah, and they're not going to for another year or two. I think household formations is something that's really interesting to me. Um, you know that that natural step or progression in life where it's like, okay, you get married, have the kids, you need a house at that point. You, Apartment living is probably not the ideal fit when you got youngsters. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of watching that trend unfold is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, Austin continues to grow. Our economy is super strong. Um, I just, you know, if we're not going to be building enough, it's just what a great position to be in long term. Right. It's, I mean, look how beautiful our city is. I think the one, the one thing that makes me nervous, water. I think in Texas is mm -hmm. something we have to really consider, especially if we continue to grow at this pace. Like, how are we going to get the water? Where mm -hmm. is it going to go? We're going to have to have some tough decisions around that. Are we at capacity? Um, again, or why do you express that concern? It's, I, we're already having troubles now. Um, with and, utilities? or Yeah, with utilities, and especially in some of these like uh, ancillary markets outside of direct Austin. And I just I think we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Like, how are these, how are these subdivisions and places going to get water for all these homes? all these developments. Um, so I think there's going to be some tough choices made. And then also if there's a broad-based uh, recession, how is Austin going to uh, uphold? One of my big things early on when we raised the money for the fund, I told you guys, hey, the one thing that gives me nervous is like if there's a tech recession. Mm -hmm. Well, we're clearly in a tech recession, mm -hmm. yeah. right? But look at the unemployment rate. Right. That's the best news we could possibly have. I mean, if that thing had doubled, oof, that'd be really tough, right? So people have jobs, they have discretionary income, <laughs> they're spending it on, on mortgages. And then my last thing I wanted to show, go to the, uh, um, what is it, the uh, Austin Round Rock tab up there at the top. The uh, recession layoffs hit California, not, not Austin. Yeah, I yeah, guess. I'm sorry, it's the chart right behind this one. Here you go? Yeah, there you go, on there, D at oh. the bottom. So the median home sale price right now is is and this is for Austin and Round Rock, is around four seventy. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I think this, there's some other really important data points here, but I don't really want to dig into those. I just want to focus on the median uh, sales price at four seventy. My thesis is you want to be at or around that number, because that means you have the largest share of people that can qualify for that. So um, there was that really cool chart that I was showing earlier, and I, it kind of correlates with this comment. Um, there it is. So this shows, oh, you just had it up, my bad. Right here. Yep. This shows um, households that could qualify for a 400K mortgage at 3% interest rates, 4%, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right now we're at like 6.5% interest rates. So that means only 30, 30 million households would qualify. So for me, for the TRE fund, if we can, if we can continue to buy, whether it be single family homes or duplexes, quadplexes that we can rent to that, to that bulk, mm -hmm. that median, mm -hmm. that's the sweet spot. Because I think you're gonna see some people that are maybe lived above their means, that can't afford that class A apartment, that are having trouble with that big mortgage that they have, and it's gonna ha they're gonna have to downgrade into a class B unit. And that's really where we thrive. I mean, because we're just class B guys, right? I mean, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that's our sweet spot. So to me, that's where you want to be. Yeah, and if, that's and interesting. You don't want to be in class A rents because class A rents, there's a lot of apartments and it's very competitive. Um, where we're at with rents, I mean, we're at like 1,200 to 2,200. That's a great spot to be. Mm -hmm. We still have room to grow those rents. We're not in over our skis. Like, it's not like we have to rent these units out for 3,000 a month or we're underwater. Right. So we're, we're perfectly strategically placed to, to, to really kind of have the most demand, either from renters or buyers. But what this graph also shows me, look at all the renters. 
yeah. that we just created by right. interest rates. Yeah, exactly. That's sad, man. To where you buy it. Yeah, it's huge. So here's something I'm trying to understand. The market's been tough. It's <laughs> tough right now, yeah. right? Like, what exactly is different from right now and a recession? Like, what is what does that look? I mean, it feels like it. Well, you got to you got to first define recession. Is it transitory? Is it? Oh man, they just two shifted, negative they just quarters. Shifted the definition of us, didn't they? <laughs> it used you to see be in the saying, textbooks. Though? It was two negative quarters of GDP growth. Um, and we clearly that I've already hit that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's the, the point. Like this feels like it, right? This feels. I mean, I well, mean, but now it's unemployment. You know, once unemployment. Yeah, once unemployment, right? It's got to be you know broad based like that. I think. Um, like, what is it pr- practically for us? Um, for real estate people. Yeah. Like, what what do we see different? I think a, a bear market, this is such a fun question. A bear market in stocks is 20% reduction. I think a 20% reduction in real estate mm-hmm. is a recession. The reason why is because, you know, if I, could, I wish I could show you this graph, but Real estate returns historically fall in between bonds and stocks. And so stocks are going to be more volatile. So they drop 20%. Like, you know, that happens pretty frequently. Yeah, on earnings call. But in real estate, it doesn't. And right. neither does it happen in bonds. But, like, are we in a, are we in a bond recession? Like, think about it this way. Like, bond, bond yields have gone up so high, so fast, that even, like, bond funds are down, like, 20% this year like I just think we're just deflating all of the yeah all of the bubble that we created with M2 money growth that we had during COVID and I think we're just seeing that deflation of the balloon that's what I'm saying is like it already it already for me it, it feels like that yeah like, yeah totally this feels like the recession yep well yeah that's I mean it's uh depends on everyone's like, but like it tech you know if you're going based on history we're we're in a the old definition. But, but here's the other thing. You know, everything in real estate is local. We're in Austin. Yeah. So, you know, mm. if we were investing in properties across the country, that may be one thing. But, like, we're just hyper-focused in Central Texas. I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't see a crazy recession in Austin, right. especially with unemployment at 2.7. Our GDP growth, I have a, another thing up there. I'll, I'll You know, I'm going to stop with all the charts. But, like, hey, they're good, man. This, GDP this is, is still you. strong. It's still really strong. Right. We had really good growth. So, <laughs> like, Austin's GDP isn't down. Mm-hmm. Nationally, we're down. What was your question? What should we expect? Yeah, I mean, I How guess should we define it too, right? Yeah, I guess I guess it's kind of answered. I mean, it's like, you know, property. Like, I don't see properties going down another hundred k. Like these ones that were selling for four fifty, now they're selling at three fifty. I can't see them going to two fifty. And I guess it comes back to it would probably be if it, here in Austin it'd be like if it, unemployment was like double what it is. Yeah. But we're just in a unique spot where it's a it's a tight time. It's it's a little bit difficult. It, it was it was different too. I mean, uh, so from June till now uh, is also us leaving the hottest part of the year and going into the worst part of the year. Yeah. Season for adjusted, for, for, for sure. residential real estate sales. Yeah. So, I mean, that plays a big part into what we've been seeing. And come the start of the year, if demand starts picking back up, uh, you know, on people buying homes after the holidays, then that could likely, you know, change things too. I don't know. To me, this is the most exciting time yeah. we've been in the game. I mean, very. Because it separates the men from the boys, right? Yeah. And like, who are the good operators who aren't? And uh, I was talking to a, a buddy of ours, Jerry, th- just earlier, and I was like, man, this is a chance where you could really like put your throat on the market. Yeah. You know, you can really leave for sure. Like, if you've got cash on the sidelines, what an opportunity! Mm-hmm. Like, how exciting is that? Yeah. yeah. We're doing all kinds of fun, creative deals. Alex touched on it earlier. We don't know what the next six to nine months is going to look like as far as deal creation and what's going to be making money, but like, we're doing interest-only deals. Or like not, or not interest only, but we're doing uh, seller finance deals, which is really fascinating. Yeah, um, that's becoming like widespread for us now. Right, we're getting rates at like four percent. Yeah, so like all this talk about interest rates, we're <laughs> right. we're baking them in at four. Right. It just looks different. We're just banking with somebody else. Right, right, and we're buying them at a discount. And uh, man, it's just really hard to be bullish. Uh, I'm sorry, bearish against Austin. Yeah, for the next decade. And like, if the worst. If the worst came the worst for our fund, and we had to hold the fund two years longer than we wanted to, three years longer than we wanted to, to get a better return, that's not bad. Right. I mean, it really isn't when you look at it. Sure. 
But these moments in time with all the noise and, you know, we're in it day to day, Mm -hmm. we feel it differently. But Mm -hmm. really, like if you take that long term approach that we've always had Mm -hmm. and just kind of just sit back and go, okay, rates are probably going to have to come down eventually. Right. Um, We can refi those properties at that time. Um, and we can we can find other creative solutions to, to maximize returns for folks. Yep. Yeah, it's gonna hit uh, it's gonna hit you know a bottom here. Like you're asking how much further down, but this is the uh, median uh, close price. This is through ABOR, so not specifically Austin, but all listings listed on ABOR. <coughs> but uh, the close the median close price. Uh, so you know as you can see, this is over the last two years. So Jan yeah January 2020. Uh, you know, it, we were at what, like 270, give or take, and then hopped up to like 425, 430, and then now we're at 345 this last month. Um, and so really, we're only back down to about March uh, area of 2021. And if it kind of levels out here and starts incrementally going back up, maybe it's not going to have this huge diagonal that we saw in 2020, but mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I guess, like, when I think of recession, it feels like this. The only other thing it would be is, like, n- you drive by and none, nobody's in any of these restaurants. Yeah. But, like, they are all they're all have people still in them. They're not nearly as booked as they were. I mean, things were yep. just crazy. Yeah. Every restaurant was just packed. Everyone was throwing around money. But they're when? still busy. Oh, just the last four or five years here? I can tell you we're retail setting records right now in Austin. Because I get to see the sales per square foot data, it's off the charts. It's good. Really? We had our best year this past year, yeah. <clears throat> You're going to see, uh, you'll see it in different ways, right? And different people are going to see different things, uh, you know. Um, but, like, I would imagine, depending on which sectors are being hit, that people are going to start allocating their money differently. They're going to stop spending in certain ways, but they're going to probably increase spending in others. So you'll see things increase, other sure. things decrease. It's not going to be max exodus of, like, Everybody goes inside until that's what that's what because I've never yeah. been through. If you, a rec- if you did that though, but think about it, like if there was max ex- exodus and nobody went outside, nobody spent money, the problem would get way worse. Right. You you know we need to spend more money to to get out of the recession to get the economy. Sure. Don't you feel like there's always that like, uh oh, that one moment though when we hit a real nasty recession where it's like you can pinpoint it like that was the event mm-hmm. almost like uh, when Tom Hanks got COVID. Remember that? Like that would to me, I think that was like the <laughs> night everyone blew up, right? Uh-huh. There was definitely that moment. I still haven't felt that moment yet, though. Right? Sure. Maybe you guys have, can think of one, but I'm seeing used cars down. Cars in general are getting smoked right now. All the kind of anyway, uh, used cars are down. What, commodities prices? are down. Yep. Um, bonds are down. Stocks are down. Real estate's down. Like I feel like everything is just down. It's like everything less, bubble is down. I've yeah. gotten less calls about. Uh, selling my Toyota Prius. <laughs> Usually the Toyota dealerships call frequently uh, to try and get me to go trade it back in or sell it. The whole FTX Alameda thing. Yeah, that was, you know, that's that's could, a pretty be, that could have been the big pin. Yeah. That could have been the pin. Yeah, I mean, the crypto stuff is just off the charts crazy. Binance, I'm hearing kind of interesting rumors on yeah. Binance. I can't get over the NFTs. Like, remember, wasn't there one that sold for $100 million? You remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's all kinds like, of... Like, how is that even worth a million now? Like, nobody... <sighs> You know what I mean? I don't hear too much about NFTs. Anymore. I know you don't hear anything. There is, a, isn't there, like a psychology around like it's really hard to be patient and sit on money, right? Yeah. Like if a lot of people that want to buy a home are sitting on the sidelines for a year, that money's got to be burning a hole in their pocket. And I think there's going to be kind of this equilibrium between sellers kind of conceding mm-hmm. a little bit and buyers kind of conceding a little bit and kind of meeting in the middle. Yeah. And I think that's we're going to kind of watch that play out over the next six to nine months. Yeah. But I definitely feel like that's where we're at, um, especially once we get rid of a lot of that product from from the uh, for for development builders and stuff um, for cell development. Once that kind of glut gets removed from the equation, but uh, now it's a fascinating time. Interesting man. times. Well, uh, to to kick it off, to get out of here, like final pieces of advice for investors, entrepreneurs, you know, just people in general that are interested in real estate. Uh, on the real estate specific side, yeah. Read um, statements from REITs. You know, so they send out these like quarterly packages. Mm-hmm. Just pick up some, read some. Um, 
I could I could I could name some books and stuff, but like what specific reads do you like reading? Um, there's uh, uh, Well Tower is an interesting one that I like to read. Um, there's a triple net lease uh, deal that I follow. There's a lot of retail that I follow. Um, so I kind of pick those up because I want to see trends and what they're kind of talking about. I think it's really interesting data. But the other thing I was going to say is like all back to this action thing on um, to, to go full circle. Go on like a loop net and just start breaking these things down. Like whatever asset cl class you like. If you like, hey, I really like Austin. Okay, cool. What, kind of, what do you like in Austin? Well, I, I like industrial buildings. Okay. What type? Well, I like, you know, ones that are usually 3 million to 10 million. Okay, perfect. Go and, you know, bird dog those. Yeah, start looking. Download the package, put it into a formula, and see, <coughs> just start playing around start with talking, it. Start talking. You yeah. have to, like, start to, like, kind of comprehend what these things are going to look like uh, and start studying that market, study the landlords that are in that market. One of my first things that I did is I found a product type of retail that I liked, and I databased all the landlords in Austin. And that way I have all their information. I can send them a mailer. I can call them, you know. Sometimes this information isn't perfect, but at least you have a category of all the entities that own it. And you can start kind of tracking the movement of that. Yeah. Um, it didn't take me more than like a couple of days to do this, by the way, of like, you know, just a couple hours at a time. And uh, I think that's really good advice. Um, and then just, you know, just understand that this is a long-term game. Yeah. You know, um, certainly people can flip things and they can make a quick buck. Uh, but again, at a certain point, the problem becomes, what do you do with that money? Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea of just whatever you're doing, compound it in a good way. Yeah. Compound it, whether it be education, uh, find tools to maximize your system. The, the thing that changed my life is just like looking at my income streams as a business and treating it as such uh, and find good investments and different strategies and allocate appropriately and just continue to watch it compound. Amen. And it's amazing over, you know, you and I talked in 17, that was our first deal that we did together is uh, in that apartment deal in San Antonio. And mm -hmm. since then it's been like 12 other deals for me. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, it's, you know, it's <coughs> fun to kind of watch the growth and kind of learn, but um, just keep studying your market, your niche and, and just keep growing. Love it, man. That's true experience wisdom right there. From well, I got around. a lot of gray hairs now. You notice that? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I'm getting them. Who do you, who do you kids. take uh, more more wisdom from, the gray hairs or, or the uh, the cowboy hat? I mean, I'm staring gray at this. Look at sure. this. Look at this. Look at this guy. He's got beautiful hair over here. <laughs> <laughs> Growing great. it out, baby. Well, we appreciate you guys. Uh, Jason Ricks, Coffin, Matt Typke here. And um, if you guys have any interest in Austin or in our fund, you know, please never hesitate to reach out. We get you connected with Jason if you want to. Um, we're always here to be a resource. Don't get discouraged. You know, Austin's still Opportunity City, but regardless, wherever you're at, there's always opportunities. So just get in the game, hustle, find the right people, take some wisdom that you've gotten here, and uh, never give up. Keep pushing. Appreciate you guys. God bless.